All right, let's get started then. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, so, yeah, my name is Julian, um, and I'm going to be talking about, about Nix. Oh, yeah, so people come in and finish they get their lecture from Cody. Um, so, yeah, today we're going to talk about Nix. Um, before we kind of get into this one, I just want to caveat that, you know, this is obviously a conference about layer twos and lightning impediments. Uh, we're perhaps obviously not talking about layer twos and lightning in this talk. If you're looking to have your lightning fix, you are in the wrong room. Um, it's just a caveat. So, um, before installing Nix for this conference, how many people have used Nix in the past show of hands? Okay, cool. Awesome. Perfect. So, um, yeah, I, I currently, I'm a head developer relations for a company called Flocks that's building stuff on Nix. Uh, I've been fell down the Nix rabbit hole a couple years ago, and um, I think you know, the goal with this talk is not to kind of teach you guys how to use Nix, not teach you guys how to package stuff for Nix. Uh, the goal here is really, I'm calling this an orientation, um, because that's really what I want this to be, is to kind of place Nix in the conceptual space of like where it's useful, why it's useful, you know, where to use it, where not to think about it. Um, you know, this won't be very hands-on, we're gonna look at very little code. Um, the thing with Nix that I think is is hard, and I think Nix has this reputation of being like, um, everything on, on hard mode uh, is like the most crazy thing to learn and things are incredibly difficult, um, is that it's actually, it's just like this, the, the conceptual space where it fits is, is specific and is very different from any tool you've really worked with before. Um, so I think this kind of thing is actually useful to just give you guys the lay of the land and then you guys can at least have a better map of your, your journey of where you want to go tackle this stuff a little more, a little more deeply. And I'll give you guys some pointers for that. Um, so yeah, feel free to interrupt at any time with any questions. You know, I'll hopefully leave some room for questions at the end, but um, So let's get started. Um, let's see, it's a little better. Um, so yeah, let's start with why Bitcoiners should care. You know, this is Nix for Bitcoiners, and I'm trying to like limit the scope of all the things we could possibly talk about with Nix to specifically you guys as Bitcoin engineers or engineers working in the space. Um, where why Nix may matter for you, right? Um, we'll talk about Nix's big idea. I think there's there's like a really key thing that Nix gets right um, that is important to understand. That is really like an quote unquote innovation or you know, a change in methodology that matters very deeply. Um, we'll talk about how people use Nix in practice. I think like between consume, like as users of Nix and as, you know, builders that build Nix expressions, these are very different uh, user journeys, if you like. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about that. And we'll talk briefly about Nix Bitcoin and some other kind of uh, rabbit holes you all can dig into next. Okay, so this Zoom is like not working how I want it to. There you go, that's much better. Uh, I will let you guys read this. I'm not going to lecture you first thing in the morning. Uh, this is a this is a tweet from uh, Jameson Lott, who had this nice little five tweet thread uh, that I think exemplifies why Nix is important. Um, and so the main idea is that you know software doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, all everything we do in Bitcoin, all the values that we have in Bitcoin, are downstream of our ability to build open source software and to operate in an open source software space that is functional, right? Um, you know, we're seeing Fox projects become un uh, unbuildable after a short time frame. We need better tooling to handle this complexity lest we fall off the shoulder of giants. And uh, this is really the why of things. I don't think I could summarize this more clearly than this, right? Um, if we can't have, if we can't build over the, you know, years of open source tooling, um, efforts of open source maintainers over the years to continue building software and building it in a way we understand or can see or, or make sense of and use it as the foundations for building Bitcoin and the stack on top of it, we're gonna lose, right? You can build as much cool Bitcoin software as you want. If no one's uh, maintaining glibc upstream of it, you're screwed, point blank, right? So Bitcoin evolves in this ecosystem of open source software and um, you know we care very deeply about open source software as a movement, you know? Uh, we. We think that the, the cause of human freedom at large is very much dependent on open source software being successful. And how do we maintain it? How do we make sure it is uh, safe 
as secure, that we have security methods around open source software, that maintenance happens. Um, this is, I look at this as a crucial, if not like civilizational question. Right? And I think Nix is going to offer us a few answers, if not some like good directions uh, to put it. So, um, you know, some of you, I hope, run Linux, some of you run Mac. Um, the story is kind of the same between the two, but you know, we can start with maybe the, the Linux file hierarchy standard, right? At most software that you install expects your system to be formatted a certain way. You're expected to have, you know, a bin folder, a dev folder, Etsy is supposed to be somewhere, you're gonna have a lib folder, etc. Max is a little different, but the story is effectively the same. Um, all the software you install, whatever method you choose to install it, depends on the place it is installing it to. Right? So it makes assumptions about where that software is run. Um, this is, you know, there's a burden of maintenance in that respect, and that when you package something, you want it to, uh, you have to expect that your the place where it's running is formatted in a certain way. Um, this makes it very difficult. If you want to run on a Raspberry Pi, if you want to run on older hardware, if you want to run on esoteric hardware, um, some of you that may have been following kind of what Bitcoin Core does, um, you know, we make sure that Bitcoin can run on stuff as weird as like PowerPC, uh, X32 architectures, et cetera, et cetera. There's a burden of maintenance here um, that comes with handling different locales. Um, the current state of how we do software is also this great archipelago of package managers. You know, we have, if you're running Mac, you're running Homebrew. If you're running Debian, you're running Apt. If you're running Fedora, you're running RPM. If you're running, you know, there's Pac-Man, there's Arch, there's uh, F-Droid, there's OpenBSD ports. All these things are duplicative work, right? You know, if open source is hard to do and to maintain packages at the get-go, we're also doing this across all these different locales independently. Everybody has to have a team of maintenance uh, maintainers that is unpaid, that is doing the same work that someone else is doing for a different locale. Um, so if we were to care about making open source less expensive to do and less uh, hefty to maintain and to make sure that it lives into the future, you are going to want uh, this cost to be lower in one way or another. Or find a way to make this work and everybody continues living in their little silos. Um, there's a portability question here, right? Like if I package something for homebrew, I can't really uh, make it run on Debian necessarily. I can have it run on any architecture I want. Um, and yeah, so the open source is really like this little archipelago of little islands of people doing their own work and repeating it, right? Um, this isn't really you know, a question of ideology. It's not because people really are waging war over whether you should use Arch or Homebrew. Um, it's more a question of like a historical, you know, we've never figured out how to have a universal package manager and you know, and, and this is what makes it, right? Um, Okay, we build our computers like we build our cities, over time, without a plan, on top of ruins. This is, I think this is a beautiful and very true quote, right? And this, this works as much for your individual machines as it does for our computing infrastructure at large, right? Stuff just keeps piling on and on, and we try to deal with the complexity we've inherited over decades, and try to wrangle it as much as we can. In, in many ways, this is the story of Docker, right? Docker was so successful, is so successful, because it allows you to just run a few commands and obfuscate all this complexity and have this nice little container that runs the services and doesn't have to deal with the cruft that has come before, right? Um, but this happens for your machine as an individual developer as well, right? Uh, if you, you know, you build a project, Python 2.7, you fast forward five years, you're trying, you've got a million different repos on your machine, you're trying to like handle uh, upgrading or you want to bump to a new Python version and it breaks all your other stuff. I, I think everyone has run into this at some point, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, this is like common course and we take it as like, oh, well, welcome to the pain of being a developer. And it's like, there are better ways, right? We can, I think Nix has some good answers for us here in, in avoiding this continual pain of maintaining our own machines over the long term uh, and have, making sense of different versions of running others' code without fear of breaking other things on your system. Um, and yeah, this is this is a common problem. I think I don't need to sell you guys on this one. Uh, okay, so you know, 
what is the big idea with Nix, and why are people so so hyped on it? You know, uh, you know, uh, Nifty asked me to do a talk on this, and I didn't realize they were going to like force you guys to install Nix before you guys showed up. So this is great. I didn't, you know, I thought I was just the only one who gave a shit about this. Um, but you know, the main, you know, Nix is a very large ecosystem, and uh, you know, in many ways, it's presented quite poorly. Uh, the documentation isn't great, but uh, you know, the, it's really like the, the whole space is hard to map out. And, right. um, but the core idea is very simple. The core idea is, uh, is really these three things. It was introduced uh, in 2006. This guy called Ilko Dolstra wrote a, started coding on Nix and then defended his PhD thesis, which was called the Purely Functional Software Deployment Model, which you can think of as the, the Nix white paper, if you like. Um, and it's, it's a PhD thesis, so it's quite long. You know, I don't recommend you read it cover to cover, but it is quite good to control F and like look around and get the main bits and the pieces of how they were thinking about it back then, because all the building blocks are there, right? Um, and it's kind of it's also kind of a joke, right? Uh, purely functional, we mean that it, it does do pure evaluation of packages, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, it's functional in that Nix is a language to handle packages, but purely functional in that it just works, and this is the goal, right? Um, the thing you hear a lot in, in working with Nix is that people say it, it removes works on my machine. And that's a pretty big claim because this is something that as developers we've been fighting for a long term, a long time. Of, you know, making sure that the code that runs on your machine on my machine works the same on yours. But Nix can actually make this guarantee and make it very true. And that's uh, that's not a small thing, right? That's an important thing to have achieved. Um, and finally, it's about software deployment, right? It's about like how do we move software from one place to another? How do I move it from you know a package cache to my machine? How do I move from my machine to your machine? How do I deploy it to production? And how do I manage these deployments, right? It's about moving software and getting to, to that question is really where you get to, to Nix's core, um, core idea. So there's really three things you need to know, right? Um, Nix builds packages in a pure way. And what we mean by pure is that it doesn't need to assume anything about your local machine, right? It, and build a package in its own little sandbox, whether you're Mac, whether you're Raspberry Pi, whether you're Debian, it simply does not care, right? Um, this means that you get this like reliability, this uh, consistency of building software, and we'll get into kind of more of the specifics of why this is important. Um, the only side effect of this uh, function is that it drops uh, binary, the build package, onto your machine. That's it. And it drops it into one place and one place only, and that is the next score. So, if you download a package or build a package today, you're going to have like you know lib user bin. It's going to be scattered across this you know assumed uh, structure of your machine that we talked about earlier. Um, Nix does away with that and says everything is going in the Nix store, all of it. Um, this also means that you can continue running you know your homebrew or apps in parallel with Nix, and there's no issue whatsoever, right? Because Nix is just in this little like corner of your computer and doesn't really care what happens elsewhere. Um, so I think I often remind people of this when they, they start using Nix because um, you know you don't have to throw away your existing workflow to experiment a bit with Nix, and it's not going to, to harm your machine in any meaningful way to just start downloading packages. Like this, right? um, yeah, I meant to mention this earlier, but you know I think one of the reasons I wanted to do this talk as Nix for Bitcoiners is that there's a lot of really nice conceptual um, mirrors with Nix and Bitcoin that I think Bitcoiners should appreciate. Um, that, that are going to make sense to you guys. And one of them is that everything is identified with a hash. So this means that you know, when I build a package, when I throw it in the Nix store, uh, everything is going to be prepended with a hash that is the hash of the package you just built. So I can you know, build Python, different versions of Python, different versions of Rust, different versions of any package you want. And, it's, and as far as Nix is concerned, they are different packages. Right? It's not like your, your machine needs to know that there is only one Bitcoin or only one Python or only one Rust. To, to Nix, there is absolutely no difference, right? And so let's let's look at this a little bit more clearly to, to hammer this one. So if I you know if I look at my my Nix store on, on this machine, um, I look for the Rust compiler, uh, and I have you know a handful of different versions of Rust, and all of them are prepended with this long hash, and uh, you know within you know one of these uh, the binary that was built of the Rust compiler, I get you know what you might expect Rust C, Rust dog, uh, I don't know. Do Rust much, so I don't know what Rust GDB is all about, but you don't tell me. Um, but everything is nicely compartmentalized, right? And so you can imagine that if you choose to run a, a program with, you know, an older version of the Rust compiler, it just goes and looks up the right version it needs and runs it. 
if you need to run a version with a later version, it just goes and finds it. Because as far as Nix is concerned, these are fundamentally different packages. Cool. So we are we are very far from the, the current state here already, right? We're, we're not very deep into this, and we're, we're super far from the way package managers work today and how we manage our machines. Um, so, you know, I know some of you already know some Nix, but like, I don't want to. I don't want to dive too deep into like the, the thorny parts of Nix and you know try to give you guys a map. But um, one key thing we need to understand is that a Nix expression is a function, and this function builds a package. So when we say that Nix is functional, we mean that you take inputs, whatever these might be, could be text files, could be other packages, could be configuration, could be all the things you need to build this package. You take it, you throw it in this isolated little sandbox on your machine, whatever your machine is. And it outputs a package, right? Inputs to outputs. Uh, if some of you, you know, code functionally, I'm sure this will be quite familiar. Uh, and the, the principles are, are just the same. The, the one thing that is maybe useful to point out here is that um, Nix is a, so there's, Nix is a package manager, we've said that. Uh, unfortunately, they also named Nix the language you use the package with Nix. <laughs> so this is where this gets super annoying. Um, but you know, there, there's a Nix programming language that's essentially, you know, like like um, like Bitcoin Script is a very restricted set of things to do a very specific set of operations. The Nix language is a very restricted set of things to build packages, right? Uh, and its its goal is to just be able to do this function in a sandbox and have one output, one side effect, one outcome, which is the package you want it to build. Um, you can do fun stuff here. So let's. Zoom this one out a bit. I couldn't fit into one slide. Um, I apologize for the lack of syntax highlighting here, but um, I wanted to give you guys just a high level sense of what a Nix function looked like. This is pseudocode, by the way. This is not a valid Nix function. I renamed some stuff just to make it a little bit clear. But if you look like on the, the top here, this little bracketed thing before the colon, these will be your inputs, right? So this is Bitcoin, right? Um, we need boost for C. We need zero NQ. There's a whole long list of things. You know, I highly recommend you guys go and look at the Nix uh, expression in Nix packages um, to see kind of what the full expression looks like. The output build is a function, and it takes all this stuff as arguments, right? So this is a one function. It's, the output's going to be a package, and it's going to take all this stuff as arguments. We're going to go fetch the source from Bitcoin Core. Uh, we're going to give it a shot to make sure that we got exactly the tarball that we expected. We're going to validate that the thing we're getting is exactly what we want. Uh, we're going to provide some build inputs to this function. So we're going to say, when you go to build, you're going to need these items, and just these items. And that's all you're going to be available. When you're in your sandbox, you are absolutely dumb. You know nothing about the rest of the world. You know nothing about the internet. You're going to use just these items and include them in your build. Um, you know, I, we, talk, we just talked about the Nix programming language a little bit. Um, here's an example of where this might be useful. Uh, the runtime dependencies you need to run the Bitcoin Core binary is if it's Linux, well, actually throw in this into the runtime dependencies of this package. If you're on Darwin, you're going to need hex dump and some other stuff. Again, I've simplified this just for examples. Um, and if you're running Bitcoin with the GUI, you're going to need a wrapper to run Qt applications, right? Um, this is a very simple example, but I think you can like maybe intuit why how complex you can get here. You can start doing incredibly complex multivariate paths of what happens when you build a package dependent on the locale where you're building it or the target that you're looking for, right? Uh, the point here is that this is one expression. Like there is there is a function in GitHub that you go fetch and run that will run depending you're on Mac or on Linux or whatever. So as a maintainer, you no longer need to go fight every ecosystem and every archipelago on its own. You have one place where this can happen, and this is a Nix expression. Cool. Um, yeah, and finally, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about like how I'm getting into the, the, the open source maintenance part of things here. Um, but every package contains a metadata field, and this tells you who maintains this. Who do you go ask about who, how to build this package and how to bump the version or whatever? Uh, what's its license? Uh, what's its homepage? Where's the change log at? What is the GitHub repo where it comes from? Um, this is more like what I can do. I can go, you know, say my organization runs its own, uh, you know, set of Nix packages, and I very quickly want to look at all the licenses that are running in my production system. 
it's a function. I go through all the next expressions I'm running, I pick out the licenses, and I say, cool, here's your list. Um, you know, for you might think like in a simple example, compliance is a good way to think about this, but really this is about visibility, right? You're able to see quickly how everything is set up and how what your ecosystem, what your open source visibility ecosystem looks like. In this case, you know, the, the Nix expression in uh, Nix packages maintained by uh, Pavel Rysnak from Trezor and Russell O'Connor from Blockchain, right? Um, so you know who's, who's running on. Um, any questions so far? Yeah. Yeah, good question. Okay, so with the missing right? Can you have a build system? Is it a build system, by the way, or does it only uh, assemble pre-built items? Um, you provide it a builder. Every build expression, you can choose whatever your builder should be. So in many cases, it's just bash, and then you run like, you know, then you make, then you this, then you whatever. So you, you, you take in different builders and you assemble them in whatever way you see fit. So you have a, you know, thanks to redundancy based dependency, I mean, you depend on something, artifact A, it depends on C, D, D, and so on. Each of those depend on other artifacts. Like in the conventional world, corporate development world, you have Raven and Maven and those kind of system, build systems, right? That have landscape dependency management built in. And they have, they work on dependency graphs and uh, how you can specify dependencies on, you know, of your application. Now, does it have something as complicated as that, or is it much more simple? Uh, okay, so the question was, you know, there are, uh, how do we, how do we handle transitive dependencies? That is right. Yeah, sure. so like the, the dependencies of dependencies and how do you manage your entire dependency graph? Um, Nix is very good at this, and I'm actually gonna show you guys in the demo like how, or, like, how Nix does this, but effectively, when you build, like when you provide, um, the output of this build is like a spec of the build. I, I'm not gonna go, I wasn't gonna go into this, but uh, I'll, I'll summarize it quickly, um, is, it provides all the dependencies that go into it, which define all the dependencies. They're all hash related, right? So you need to go fetch all the dependencies of the dependencies. You have a whole graph, and it takes everything it needs with it, right? So when I have a built Nix package in my Nix store, it's going to take everything it needs to build it with it, right? So this is what I mean, like it's portable, right? You can take something that runs on, uh, you know, it runs on my Linux machine, I want to run it on the Linux server in the store, I can copy the closure, what we call the closure, like an entire dependency graph, and it will run exactly the same. Yeah, this uh, Nix has perfected this handling of transitive dependencies. I will say, but I'm going to show. I'm going to go into this a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a functional programming language like Haskell, where like uh, you evaluate the expression and by evaluating it, it reduces it to like just a couple of passes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the comment was uh, this is yeah, it's like Haskell, and, and people often call Nix. They often uh, look at Nix and walk away because they're like, it's like Haskell people build a package manager, and I want <laughs> no part of this. <laughs> um, and you know, in a ways, in a ways, that's very fair. You know, and uh, whatever, you know, no comment. Um, so, okay, so let's talk about Nix packages a little bit further. Um, so another version of the word Nix that we're going to walk through now is Nix packages. So we've got Nix the package manager that handles how to build packages. We talked about Nix the language that is, you know, the language that helps you build stuff. Um, the thing that I think that I really want Bitcoiners to uh, grasp is, or even not even Bitcoin, just like open source at large, we have this thing called Nix Packages. Nix Packages is a Git repository that contains a bunch of expressions like the one I showed you. Um, it has 80,000 plus packages, uh, I'll show you graph in a second, but this is the largest package repository in existence that humanity has ever had, point blank. The biggest free software repository ever. Uh, and no one knows about it, or well, I mean, most people are like, yeah, whatever, this is a cute esoteric thing. It's not, it's a juggernaut. And understanding that you can fork Nix packages, build your own expressions, have a subset, override what you want, is uh, a great, great weapon in the availability of, of, of maintaining open source software for the long term. Um, Nix packages evolved, you know, from the, obviously the implications of being able to do this kind of stuff, but it really took off when people started to build uh, the Nix operating, I shouldn't mention the Nix operating system yet, we'll talk about that later. Um, why is it so big, right? Um, why is it 80,000 packages? The reason, mostly, is that all the packages, like I mentioned before, are, are cross-architecture, cross-operating system. So think about, like, from a maintenance perspective, right? Uh, you have this repository, and you build your package for different, you know, different architectures, different operating systems. Um, the people that are using it are like, hey, wait, what's this next thing? 
oh, okay, like, let me contribute back just for one from my, from my machine to make sure this still works on Linux or make sure this still works on Mac. Let me patch it for this, let me patch it for that. And all of a sudden, more packages become more available to more venues, which helps more people maintain. And that you have this like positive flywheel of like, because you have more people that use it, that see the availability, the possibility of having it on different machines, decide to contribute back, blah, blah, blah. And so there's been this like uh, slow snowball effect of maintainers growing. And it's been, it was spurred by the Nix operating system, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but this has, you've seen a bit like the hockey stick graph of contributors in uh, Nix really start hitting in the last three years. Um, we've gone from maybe like 2,000, 3,000 contributors to we're up to five or six now. Um, and it's, uh, it's really hit and escape velocity, I think. So, um, let's see if we can pull this up. Second, I want to show you guys just visually how what this looks like. Okay, so this is uh, how many fresh packages are there, i.e., packages that are up to date with their latest or last versions, versus the number of packages in the repository on the x-axis. In this quadrant, in the lower right is everything you've ever used. Homebrew, apt, Fedora, everything. Next package, this is Arch. We should, we should do like a good mention for Arch because they do do an excellent job of, of package maintenance and everything else. Next package is stable from last year. Next package is stable from this year. Uh, next package is, oh, sorry, next package is stable from you know, 18 months ago. Next package is stable from October. And I guess I didn't do this right. Next package is unstable is all the way up right? How's the view, fam? You know? Um, this is really amazing that this is true, right? That we have a package system that is uh, this much ahead of the game so quickly with so little, uh, I don't want to say so little adoption, but so little widespread awareness, right? Um, and so I really wanted to change the conversation around like Nix being this weird esoteric thing to being something that is really ahead of the game in many respects. Um, okay, so um, but, you know, I don't want to like, you know, yeah, Nix is so great, blah, 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 but really like, Nix is just a manner of handling open source packages in a more sane way. So it's active, uh, it's highly automated, so if you do, uh, uh, you know, version bumps or the ability to deprecate packages, they've really automated every part of open source maintenance in, in really nice ways. Um, you know, I, I recently contributed, uh, or I'm in the middle of contributing the, the Nostr RS Relay, um, Next expression, and I get emails like every 12 hours or something about, hey, by the way, were you like bumped your thing, or just making sure it still works with the existing package expression, or I'm getting like spammed by Nix packages about like all the stuff they're doing to make sure the package still runs. It's just like, it's amazing. Um, and the important part is that it's open, right? Like the, I don't know how many of you have ever looked at, say, um, you know, the Debian package repository. But what they do is that they basically copy all the source code, they do a copy of GitHub, of like all the packages they need, and then overlay it with all the Debian stuff they need on top of it and maintain it that way, right? Um, Nix packages is just a bunch of these package expressions that goes out and fetches the source they need from whatever locale they need. Um, it's, a, it's a nested set of functions, right? So I can just query it. I can go and look for uh, whatever I want into it. And so it's, it's very... Uh, Open in that respect. And I'll, actually, I'll show you guys this. This will be easier to show you guys. Um, last week, 230 authors, 1,000 commits, 1,000 files, 44,000 editions, 20,000 releases. That was last week, right? To give you a sense of like how fast this is moving. Um, it's not like a niche thing. But let's, is that excluding bots? No, this is very much including bots. <laughs> very much including bots. But I mean, bots are your friend. I mean, no, seriously, like, why, why wouldn't you automate this, you know? Um, okay, so now, now that I've convinced you that Nix is, uh, you know, about to take over the world, uh, let's, let's, like, level a little bit and talk about how Nix is used in practice. Um, as a consumer of software, what do you get, right? I think, you know, something I will maybe, you know, that's very apparent in the Nix community is, you know, they're really a bunch of hackers that are in love with the idea. 
And so they, they get very obsessed with esoteric topics of packaging and reproducibility and all these things. And sometimes they forget like to tell people as like, what's your user story? Like really, what is, as a user, what do you get? Um, the main, you know, one of the main things that, that's absolutely wonderful is that it's a universal package manager. So whether you're running on Mac, whatever venue, I've mentioned this three times, I probably don't need to repeat it, but a universal package manager, it bears repeating, this is, we don't have this. We don't have this. And this, this will save you hours of sanity of moving from different types of machines to another if you have a package manager that works in all the venues the same. Okay. The real, I think, thing that is, as a user of software, um, if you have a, you walk into a Git repository, every, this has happened to everyone, I think. Um, you know, you walk in, maybe it's a stack you've never used before, or maybe it's a different version or a different combination of technologies. And you sit there and you ask yourself, okay, how much time am I gonna spend setting this up correctly and making sure I have everything I need? And if you're lucky, you see that there's a Nix file already set up and the developer has done the work to package it for Nix. If that's true, you are one command away from having a complete isolated setup that can't break your system. Nix develop, you get a developer shell with all the dependencies you need set up in your, in, on your machine and gives you an isolated shell to work in. So think about this from a, you know, Nix build is the same thing for just actually building the package at the repository you're doing. Um, you know, in Bitcoin we work with fairly complex stacks. Um, some of this stuff is, is quite involved. Um, with this, you, you, you know, from an open source maintenance perspective, the, the, the biggest currency or the biggest thing or bottleneck we have is people's time and people's attention and how long it's going to take before they get frustrated and give up. And if you're a user, if you want to be a contributor, you want to be able to walk into and just start working. That would be great if that were true. And uh, Nix makes this not only possible, but real, right? You're able to really just show up at a repo, Nix develop, you're done. You're ready to go. You can start coding, start contributing uh, as quickly as possible, right? Um, the third value that, that I think Nix has something really important to offer is, is you know, I call this bulletproof packages. Um, since Nix has, you know, all of its dependencies bottled with it, and if you have a Nix expression that works, if you build a Nix expression that works and you specified it as, you know, in a static way or whatever, um, that package is going to continue building. Like you, you can pick it five years from now or whenever it's going to be, it's going to keep working. It's a set, it's built in a sandbox, it's deterministic, it's going to work the exact same way. And now I should say, I should caveat this a little bit by saying, um, you know, this isn't true all the time. There are plenty of ways in which you can shoot yourself in the foot with this, but this is much, much easier than uh, depending on a Debian expression or a homebrew expression that is uh, not pinned and not built in a sandbox and not and not deterministic by any means. Um, there's no guarantee that your homebrew package will continue working if you, should, if you take the same expression. Um, yeah. And you know, I, I mentioned transparency. You're able to view your whole dependency graph you know, we're obviously exposed to a lot of vulnerabilities and, and uh, upstream vulnerabilities of libraries is something we want to be able to have visibility into. Uh, and Nix makes this very easy to look at a package, look at all its dependency graph, get the exact versions, watch all the build flags for that uh, particular library and whatever, and have a very uh, thorough view of what you are dealing with in this software package. Um, okay, I've, to I've told you all the good, uh, now we get to talk about the bad. Um, Nix is not all fun and games. Uh, you know, Nix is a very difficult thing to grok and work with. I think this is where people kind of get turned off from Nix and say this is way too esoteric. I do not want to deal with packaging something with this level of complexity and esoterica and functional language and whatever. Um, the main reason Nix is difficult, and I think the fundamental one, is that Nix takes all the complexity of your build systems, everything that you has been hidden behind your cargo build flags or NPM installs, or the things that are just, you know, tooling that makes it super easy to just get started. And it takes away all of that and forces you to deal with the complexity of your build systems. It forces you to deal with it. You, and, and people see this as a bug. Um, and I consider this a feature. This is a feature. Um, you, you have to be able to um, 
deal with the complexity of your software if you are to build it uh, in a safe, repeatable, reproducible way. Um, as open source developers, you know, we are uh, beholden, you know, we have responsibilities or like maybe a moral responsibility to uh, deal with the software we are providing people in as uh, transparent and as foolproof a way as possible. Um, by doing so, by forcing you to deal with the complexity of the, the software you're dealing with, uh, you're providing something that can be used easily, repeated forever, will continue to build 20 years from now, and is completely introspective. So, as open source developers, this is a cost. There is no way around it. This is a cost, right? Um, it will make your life less fun and less easy. Um, you will get something for that as a cost, um, but it will it will be a cost. There's no point in dancing around that part, right? Um, yeah. So, portable environments and and tooling. Um, as builders, you know. We would like our tools, people want to contribute to our software, we want them to be, we want to be able to run the same tools uh, on the same machine or whatever locale we decide to code in. Uh, Carl Dong had this really funny tweet one time when he he, uh, he had figured out how to save all his dot files, all his configuration for all his tools that are usually on scattered dot files all over machines and had to set up a new machine and like figure, spend half a day or two days like setting up all these configurations to make his environment work the same way and he ported it to Nix in a way that it was just like, copy the Nix file, but it done, and, and he was like, is this even legal? <laughs> and and that's, that's exactly right, right? Uh, that's, that's the feeling that you get when you finally like get to, you face the pain, you've dealt with the complexity, and you get to actually use the thing you built. That's the feeling you kind of get, is that like, is this, how is this even real, right? Um, I, I, I've contributed this as a tagline for Nix in the future. Uh, I'm still waiting for it to be taken up, but I think this is, this is pretty much the feeling you get. This is the bang for your buck, right? Um, lowering the barriers for usage and contribution. I have actually mentioned this uh, previously, apologies, but um, you know, open source does not exist in a vacuum. None of your software exists in a vacuum. And if you are thinking you're going to be a solo open source developer no one's ever going to contribute to, well, you're not really doing open source. Um, it is, I would argue, it is part of your mandate to make it easy to have a user onboard. And, you know, people do this today. You write really long readmes. You you test your installs on different uh, architectures and operating systems. You go through a lot of pain to make sure that your software runs where it's expected to, and that people that onboard to your project know how to build it, know what's in there, know why it is the way it is. You write your commit messages. Um, Nix is a way to lower the usage and contribution of open source software in fundamentally uh, obvious, beautiful ways. Okay. Um, all right, so I've talked four times about universal packaging. I'm going to skip this one. Um, a value I think people don't uh, appreciate as much. You know, we've talked a lot about building the same package on different venues and different locales. Um, an underrated value is maintaining software through time. You know, I think something that Bitcoiners have, a perspective that we have that other uh, ecosystems don't have, is that we think in decades if not centuries, about, you know, we want this system, this code, to live for decades at minimum, right? Um, not many projects think this way, right? Um, but to us, you know, a Nix expression, a Nix build, will build the same way now as it will five or ten years from now. Um, this is incredibly important, right? I think this is an incredibly underrated value and something we should really think about more deeply. Uh, how do you build an older version of Bitcoin Core? How does someone 20 years from now build an old version of Bitcoin Core? Do they, are they going to be able to find the right dependency set? Are they going to be able to have the right builders to do so? Um, none of this is obvious in how we manage software today. But Nix makes this not only easy, but trivial for many of us. Um, and yeah, like, you know, the norms of open source change. Once upon a time, GitHub wasn't a thing. Um, you know, we've come to understand what a good readme looks like. Uh, what a good onboarding experience for people looks like. Um, wouldn't it be cool if it became a new norm for open source that you arrived to a repository and there was a Nix expression there for you to just type one command and you are good to go, right? Um, in pie in the sky, you know, this is what I think about sometimes, you know, it would be, it would be a cool norm for open source for this to be true. Okay, so, um, you know, we talked a bit about maintenance through time, but this is maybe like graphically what it looks like. Yeah, now sure, you can build the packages if you're on Debian, Mac OS, Windows, 
I'm gonna troll you to death. Um, Nicholas, same deal. Um, five years from now, you know, it's it's actually quite unclear that you can rebuild software for your same home group, especially five years from now. There's no guarantee that's true. Same thing for Debian. You know, 50 years from now, there is no clue whether that's true, right? For Nix, this is not even a question. This is very simple and this is simply true, right? Um, this is like I. It's it's sometimes hard to like <laughs> be uh, like understated about Nix because these things have really important implications for how we do open source software. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. We're getting to closing time here, but um, five minutes. Five minutes. Thank you. Um, so okay. Some rabbit holes. Uh, the last like thing called Nix I'm going to introduce to you is uh, this thing called Nix OS. Um, MixOS is an operating system built on all the principles, functional, top to bottom, like you build a package, you take all the dependencies, you uh, build an output, you can do the same thing for an entire operating system. People figured this out super early, like in 06, um, I think uh, MixOS 01 was in 2014, I've been running MixOS, not on this machine, but for several years. It's awesome. Check it out, go look into it. Um, something we're going to have to face at some point as Bitcoiners is um, decentralizing package distribution. Um, there's going to be a day where GitHub censors cryptographic software or Bitcoin software. Uh, there's going to be a day where package managers censor cryptographic software or software they don't like. They already do this. Uh, we're going to have to find a way to distribute package distribution in a way that is uh, verifiable, secure, and in a way that serves our, uh, our, our goals. Um, Nix makes creating your own binary, pack, binary caches uh, very simple. And so that's something you can dig into for um, curation. Nix packages is a GitHub repo full of Nix expressions. You want to build your own, you want to override it, you want to customize it, just fork it and change it. End of story. Cool. Um, How big is it? Like data lines? It's big. Uh, I, the gigabytes? I, I actually don't know, uh, but it's, it's quite large. I, I cloned it recently and it took a while. Um, so there is this project called Nix Bitcoin. Uh, this was started by uh, a non-dev, this guy called Eric Arfstedt and uh, Jonas Nick from Blockstream. Um, Nix Bitcoin is a collection of Nix packages and XOS modules for easily installing full feature Bitcoin nodes with an emphasis on security. This is an awesome project. It's an awesome project for Bitcoin nodes in general. It makes it super easy to like write your spec of what you want, build it and ship it, right? Um, this is underrated. It's, it's super, super well done. Second, it's a great example of uh, a Nix project that's super mature. Um, you, go, you go into the, the Nix Bitcoin repository, it's got examples, shows you how to do it. It's one command to deploy a little VM on your machine to test it out and play with the configuration. Uh, it's a great example of how Nix can make the user experience of developers super, super easy. Um, it's also like really good at security. All, a lot of the, the knobs and dials you can turn are security oriented. So if you're kind of uh, focused on trying to make a very secure Bitcoin node, this is probably the best uh, project on the market, period. Okay. Um, in the time, I was just gonna like poke around in next store and show you guys like really how the dependencies stuff resolves. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna get there. Um, but uh, I'm gonna actually see this. Um, some resources. Nix is notoriously notorious for having terrible documentation. Um, this is something the community has been working on and is making really great strides in. Um, I will say that the manuals are actually quite good. Uh, the manual for Nix, the package manager for Nix packages, the, the package repository, and Nix OS are are quite good. You know, you can. There's a lot of conceptual things you need to that change the way you think, but fundamentally, like you know, look around. Uh, Nix.dev is a little community resource for kind of things you might want to do. Noogle is like this. Uh, all the type specs for all the functions that are available to you in the Nix language. Uh, awesome Nix is a kind of community curated resource of all the cool projects built in Nix. And Nix Pills was a really early kind of set of 20 kind of 20 article series written by the creator of Nix to really understand the deep dives and the conceptual underlying frameworks of what makes it work. Um, people often like start here and this is how they lose, right? They start here and they're like, I'm not doing this. And walk <laughs> uh, so really, like, look at this if you really want the deep dive. The, 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 the <laughs> um, final, like, parting thought. You know, um, we're used to the inertia of our tooling. Docker is great because Docker works. Um, we are we keep doing what we are used to having work. In Bitcoin, you know, we're thinking ahead, and so you know, I would I would 
suggest to you that, you know, try to fight the own iner your own inertia of like how <coughs> offer tooling has worked up to now. There's benefits in, in fighting the inertia and accelerating into the curve and really taking your software development to a different level for the good of open source in general, right? And so it'll make your life better. Uh, you will be building on the shoulders of giants and that's what we're doing here and that's what the future is all about. So that's that, thanks. Um, I run the Nola Bitcoin Meetup in New Orleans. Uh, if you're ever in New Orleans, please come by and say hi. I would love to host you and take you out. Um, I work for a company called Flux, which builds products on top of Nix. Uh, we're building kind of ways for enterprise and uh, making Nix a little bit easier to use for people. Check it out if you want kind of an example of a cool Nix product. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Thanks, guys. Can you, can you show us a Nix development? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, let's see. Alright. Uh, let's go. Let's REPL. Uh, Nix develop command. Let's think of a good. So, this is my work machine. It's all full of stuff. Let's see. See, like. I think I can do this. Let me see. Uh, and if, uh, ignore this uh, Fox command just because I fucked my machine. Alright. So it's going to next packages, it's going to, it's going to find C Lightning, it's going to download the whole dependency closure for C Lightning. Oh, is this on the conference line? Yeah. Oh, this is not going to work. I'll tell you what, um, I think... Do I have this one? Okay, right. Uh, um, so you have to have like a repository cloned with a Nix expression. Usually, I just download it. Um, I do this. What do I have in here that is Nix? Oh yeah. Um, no, I can't do that. Actually. <laughs> so what I got in here that is already Nix developed. This is my work machine, and like a lot of the the floss stuff we do, like. Wraps around Nix, so I can't like use the classic Nix commands to do it. So this is awkward. Do you have a remote extension that you can extension to? Uh, you know, I do not. I really should. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, that's a fun one. Like what I was going to do was show you guys. Um, uh, I was going to show you guys this. That's a store path. Um, what I really want is just do it. GQ, so it's pretty. I just went to Nix packages. Um, I went to Nix packages. I filled, I found the expression for a package called Bitcoin. Um, I told it give me all the path info for it. It spit me out all the dependencies that go for it. Um, it told me like what the exact hash for it in the Nix packages store is. It gave me the shop for it. Um, it told me the, the, the spec build where it's found, and it told me actually this. Sorry, this is lovely. This again. Uh, it told me, okay, hey, you got it from the cache. The cache provided a signature for that build, so you can verify the signature of the build provided. Um, and yeah, it really depends. You asked about transitive dependencies. This is obviously the one level dependencies, all the things that go into the immediate build. I just type recursive, and I've got a humongous list of the entire recursive dependency graph of every single hash verified signed dependency that goes into the Bitcoin build top two body. Right. Quick question. Yeah. What is the release schedule of Nix itself? Is it a, what is the release schedule of Nix? Release schedule of Nix. The, the release, yeah. Yeah. What the release? Once a year? Twice a year? So uh, Nix, the the package manager, yeah. uh, is. On a semi-regular schedule, I don't know what it is, but the that's just a tool, right? That's just the package manager itself. The packages, um, like the Nix packages, unstable is all the time. Like you can just listen to the unstable branch and like it's continually going. The the stable branch is on uh, in May and November every year. So we have if you want to pin your packages and keep on a stable branch, that's uh, yeah, that's you know you can pin it at every May and every November basically. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the Nix so that's really. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, 
YOLO, go unstable. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, should, I should really have like at least one thing I could show you guys this next to uh, Okay, no, one thing I did want to show you guys was uh, how did I. Yeah. So, I just want to make sure I'm understanding correctly. So, you guys are storing hashes in that point to dependencies or software dependencies, and then those so that pointer then references some mix expression that points to the location where you can pull that software from. Or are you guys storing the actual software on like a server in some place where you run this expression and it pulls it from there? No, no, no. Like, we're, when I uh, build a package, I'm, I'm building the dependencies that go into it. Yeah. Um, so, well, actually, I don't have to do that. Um, the reason why is a bit technical, but the, like, <coughs> basically, that if I know if I know what the build is going to output, and because this is deterministic, I often do. I don't need to actually rebuild it locally. I could just ask the the cache whether it has the exact cache for for that dependency and just download it. There's no there's no like trust assumption that's ruined when you do this, yeah. right? Which is badass yeah. already. But um, yeah, when I'm looking. So there's this thing called a derivation, which is the spec of the build, yeah. and that points to like the different dependencies where they are, yeah. and uh, those are recursive, right? So you go up the tree and you find all the things you need, and if everything checks out, you just use the binary that's been pre-built for you. You could disable this. You could say, I want you to build everything from scratch all the time. Yeah. Uh, good luck in building GLC every time you make a file Bitcoin, but like, whatever, right? Um, the, the cool thing here is that Nix gives you the flexibility to do whatever you want with this, right? Um, you can do it as, as hard mode or as easy mode as, as you like. Um, but you have the insurance that it's... Yeah, that's right, Bruce. Yeah, you have the shop. I guess in, that, in, in your explanation, where is that binary? Is that locally or is that somewhere remotely that you're deploying now? Yeah, so you can... You can download it from a cache, like the Nix, like the Nix OS Foundation runs a cache, like yeah. a multi-hundred terabyte cache of packages that is continuously serving stuff. Yeah. Um, or you can rebuild it locally and you get a binary. That's that's cool. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. AI integration? <laughs> AI integration. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, it depends what you mean by, by how difficult it is, right? Um, like, I can do, like, the show flux for half a second, you know, like I can do flux install, Bitcoin, evaluates it, downloads what it needs, and like, I've already, it goes to the next cache, it double checks the source tree, does the whole thing, and just downloads it. We're talking about, you know, Brew install is the right. exact same. Oh yeah, so I'm only using free packages only. And it's bitching about, yeah, that, that's just the flux that you want to know about. Yeah, you can, yeah. It's still, it's still just like Nix install, like yeah. Nix install, whatever. Um, so it's not more difficult in that respect. So this, this wouldn't be very hard to build though. I mean, basically you have a situation where you can run a single command, and it'll go to a GitHub repo, evaluate the click.nix file, and set up the developer. You could do this in a UI, right? Totally. Yeah. Actually, I would argue, I would argue it would be really cool if you did it with a terminal UI. Sure. That, well, so I don't know about if normies would like terminal UI, but <laughs> <laughs> some normies would and some normies would. Fair. So is is uh, Nix Bitcoin? It's just an amalgamation of different packages, right? Because it's not actually in Nix packages itself. Right? Correct. 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 Um, here, let me pull this up. Um, yeah, Nix, so Nix Bitcoin is is a is a repository for um, yep. uh, is a repository for building Bitcoin nodes. So it's not a package itself, right? Like, um, and it, it's all based on on flakes too. So I couldn't. I wanted to throw this in a REPL, and we could start playing with this and deploying our own Bitcoin nodes. But REPL doesn't support uh, flakes, so I can't do it. Um, but but yeah, you, it's, it's not a the thing you're trying to do here is build an operating system, right? It's, you're not trying to, to create a package, right? So it consumes packages in that respect, um, but it's not it's not a package itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Cool. How we feel? Yeah. yeah? Next taking over the world. Yeah. Um, we're gonna have likely a conference. It sounds like in August and. 
uh, Alpha Blue Europe with Nick's and Nick's stuff. Bless you. Um, Nick's is going to have a conference itself in probably September in Berlin, I believe. Um, so yeah, look out for those events if you're, if you're curious about more. But um, yeah, thanks a lot, everyone.